Hello, my name is Arne Solem and I'm an assistant professor in machine learning at Aalto University, Finland. This tutorial is about machine learning with signal processing. Much of my own research interests are in real-time inference, online learning and sequential modeling, all in which time plays an important role. Time is fundamentally different from the three spatial dimensions in the 4D world we live in. How is that? Well, time has a direction and observations can be ordered over that temporal direction. Of course, if you think of more general systems than just 4D spatiotemporal systems, such as basically any system or quantity that has some sort of temporal structure or dynamics over time, then it can be modeled as a spatiotemporal model. This tutorial is mostly about temporal models. I tried to provide you an overview and some ideas about various tools from signal processing that can help model time and temporal phenomena. I also tried to give you some pointers to different application areas and application examples where this can be useful. And of course, I also tried to link all this to aspects in statistical machine learning. Then again, this tutorial is not about many things. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I'm not actually considering audio processing or audio modeling at all. This is basically because audio modeling is a huge field of its own. And even though there is like very clear temporal structure in audio as well, it's sort of, it's a bit outside now, all the stuff that I tried to cover here. Also, I'm not actually considering image processing or pattern recognition that much in the tutorial, even though these are often seen as central parts of signal processing. I'm also not trying to give you a proper overview about signal processing as a whole, or any historical uh, links to uh, how signal processing and machine learning have influenced each other throughout the years. The goals of this tutorial are as follows. I try to teach you some basic principles about direct links between signal processing and machine learning. For continuous time models, I try to give you an intuitive hands-on understanding on what stochastic differential equations are all about. And throughout the tutorial, I try to show how these things in linking machine learning and signal processing can have real benefits in speeding up, improving inference, and build better models in machine learning. A word of warning. I don't have time to discuss many important and relevant works. If you notice that I've skipped something that you see as very important, please send me an email and I will include that the next time. The content of this tutorial is very much limited to my own opinions and my own narrow expertise. That is also why many of the examples considered in the tutorial are actually taken from my own work, mostly because those are examples and applications I know very well of and for which I also have material on my laptop. The structure of this tutorial is as follows. You're watching part one, which is kind of, kind of warm up, but uh, also considering some basic tools 
and discrete time modeling stuff in general. So like things that evolve over time in discrete time. That brings us to part two, which is more technical, where I try to introduce stochastic differential equations for modeling like stochastic dynamic things and combining things from part one and part two bring us to Gaussian processes. In part three, I try to give you um, kind of an overview of how Gaussian processes appear both in machine learning and in signal processing. Okay, after this, it's time for something more applied. Um, of course, I would scatter applications also into part one, two, and three, but uh, part four then considers maybe sort of more machine learningly applications uh, and examples. Good. Each part is uh, roughly 30 minutes in length, and during the conference, there are some questions uh, then, like afterwards. Okay, so part one this is the outline. Uh, first, I'm discussing and uh, sort of explaining a bit more about temporal models with some examples. Then I have some general tools for working with time series, basically stuff that people often see as, as signal processing tools. Um, I go into some more details about spectral methods. Um, we will get back to this later on as well. Uh, and then the rest of, of this part is focused on uh, discrete time models, uh, like namely state space modeling, um, which then brings us to, to uh, inference methods in discrete time models, namely filtering and smoothing. I'm also uh, talking a bit about nonlinear estimation. And a clear application area of these things is in sense of fusion. I have some examples in the end. Good. Okay, so temporal models. Uh, I already mentioned some temporal things, but maybe just to make it absolutely clear, uh, by temporal models, I basically mean one-dimensional problems. For, like, that's the simplest thing. So basically, uh, time series, where the data has a natural ordering over time. This is an example of that. Uh, this is a, like a... Well, not very well known example, but rather well known example uh, about modeling the number of childbirths um, in the US uh, over like several decades. And uh, basically, the observations are just the number of babies being born for each day. And then uh, the task here is to do some like explorative analysis about the baby delivery process or what you should. Call it. Yeah, how that has changed over the years. Like, what is the week of day effects, time of year effects, and so on. So, like, time series modeling. Of course, you can have something more complicated than just a single time series. You can have something that evolves over time and you just observe snapshots for different time points that are referred to as spatial temporal models. This could also be like multi-output time series or, or something like that. But let's talk about spatial temporal models in this tutorial. So for example, the easiest example I can think of is the weather. So here we have the amount of, of rain in Colorado uh, for different months over like several years. And the, the bottom figure here shows like the the, uh, the amount of rain in different regions, and then that, of course, then changes for different months. And it's kind of a spatial temporal problem because there's both like the spatial aspects and the temporal aspects which govern the, 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 the rainfall or like how much rain you get. Of course, this could be something more complicated, such as, such as the brain. Of course, that also is a system which uh, is dynamic and spatial. There's a lot of stuff in different parts of the brain happening. And then you can model these things as, like, as spatial temporal dynamics. And of course, that could be also like an artificial neural network or almost anything, to be quite frank. Good. Then the third bullet point on this slide is about long and unbounded data. And 
Of course, if you have a sensor, for example, like a smartphone, which provides you with data for every second or every tenth of a second or even faster, or then you can consider like daily observations of something or anything where there's no like the, the data sort of, it has no end, it just keeps coming. And good examples of that are in like sensor data and uh, sensor fusion, where you try to then combine information streams from several sensors, for example, in a smartphone. And of course, this links to like online learning, online inference, and also like real time requirements, because you don't have time to like train something and then deploy, because if you train, then sort of you're already acquired more data in like the meanwhile. So then you should have quite like fast inference going on. But yeah, let's get back to that uh, later on. How does these things show in machine learning then? If we think of machine learning such that data is an important part of that. So if your data then has like a temporal structure or the process of acquiring data uh, works somehow over time, then it probably makes sense to account for that in your models and your model sort of building as well. And if you both your data and your models have a temporal structure, then prob probably the algorithms or the inference schemes or methods that you then apply for combining your uh, models and data could hopefully somehow leverage that temporal structure. And in many cases, that actually is, is the thing. You can actually get away with faster or better methods in taking time into account in some special way. And that is what we are going to look into during this tutorial. Okay, in singular processing, uh, one very typical way of, of actually looking at the whole field of singular processing is through time. And I think that's how most people might actually see singular processing. as like uh, tools and methods for dealing with time series, sensor streams, and so on. In machine learning, a very typical way for us to look at um, basically temporal structure, or like structure in general actually, is to jointly consider like statistical properties in how data points interact. And I refer to that here as the moment representation. That basically links to like kernel methods, uh, like covariance functions, and so on, where you kind of try to look like into how data points jointly interact. Of course, then, if we have a temporal data or temporal model, which we often have in signal processing, other methods into, uh, for looking into this might actually be beneficial in different ways. Uh, one way is to look at sort of the spectral properties or the spectral representation of data or model. And that basically means to look into how things uh, work out in like, like Fourier space or like frequency space. I have a slide of this uh, next. And the third way, which is also much used in signal processing, is to look at the, the paths, how things evolve, what the dynamics of the, the system are. I refer to that as the state space or path representation. So basically looking into how the samples then, sample parts of the processes evolve over time. Let's skip the moment representation for a while and uh, concentrate on the spectral and state space representations in this first part. That's a sinusoid there. And what people often see in signal processing as a central tool is like the Fourier transform. Like 
you you Fourier transform things in order to look at uh, like the the frequency uh, sort of uh, representation of of your time series or models. So uh, this definition here is basically uh, just the Fourier transform of a process f, and this is actually now multidimensional. Uh, x can be be higher than just one dimensional, but if you replace x with t, then this would just be a temporal thing. You probably know that there are many conventions for doing Fourier transforms, like basically uh, where to put different constants, and uh, I tend to favor this like angular velocity representation where you only have like the the two pi show up in in like the inverse Fourier transform. Of course, Fourier transforms link to more general, um, like uh, harmonic analysis methods, or uh, also to like basis function approximations for various things. And uh, if you think of, of like more general harmonic analysis methods, um, for example, like spherical harmonics or, or related transforms, uh, are very related to to like this and much used in signal processing. Um, in the frequency space, and this is actually something that many people tend to link to like classical signal processing and like kind of old school methods, um, basically like analyzing like the properties of different systems, like systems meaning input output mappings. Um, things like impulse responses and transfer functions are central tools. In, in this space. And basically, this is not that different from what we do in machine learning. So if you think of input-output mappings as just sort of as, as like inputs and, and uh, observations, that's basically what we, we do for, like for regression and classification tasks. You try to learn a, a, a method that can sort of like map inputs to outputs. And that's the interest here as well. So y here, yt, is a, like a process uh, of, of uh, outputs, and xt is the process of inputs. And uh, the analysis of, 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 of this, this form, you know, like in terms of transfer functions, which is the thing that does something to the inputs in order to make them outputs. And the tools for this uh, in signal processing are, for example, like related to, to uh, doing like Laplace transforms of the inputs and outputs, and then looking at sort of the the system that you get when you when you uh, like uh, decompose this. There is very nice links here to classical machine learning and AI, uh, like automatic control and so on. Um, which I don't have actually time to look into in this tutorial properly, uh, but just the, the fact that also like activation functions in neural networks uh, have been called transfer functions in the past is, is uh, like a very nice link and tells about the sort of relationship between, between the fields early on. We will get back to Fourier transforms in, in the third part, but now let's look at discrete time state space models. So basically in discrete time state space models, the, the idea is that you have some sort of hidden states, which are, are uh, x here. Um, and basically you have then a model f that describes the dynamics from like a previous state to the next state. And the dynamics can be corrupted by some process noise, Q, in this case. And it's a discrete time model, basically a chain, it's a Marco chain of things, in the sense that the model squeezes all that it needs to know into the state X, and uh, it kind of forgets its past then, like, all the history of, 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 of the, the system is then contained in that state. And of course, then, if these are hidden, we cannot observe them directly. But instead, we have 
a separate observation model, which can give us some measurements or observations of those hidden states. And again, we define the measurements, which can be like high dimensional or basically like anything uh, as Y. And the hidden states X are observed again through some nonlinear mapping H and perhaps corrupted by some measurement noise R. This is a very general and very strong uh, family of models um, where kind of the key to efficiency is in the, the peculiar structure of the, of the graph, the chain structure, which can leverage the Markov property, which basically tells you that sort of uh, you're conditionally independent then of, of everything else, given sort of just the, the previous, previous state. Um, and this is also sort of the, the key for like real-time inference and uh, like efficiency in practice. So if you have like linear time inference or, or uh, linear memory foot, footprint uh, in, 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 the, in the number of data points or time points, then probably in there somewhere deep down in the model, there's like a Markov property or, or a Markov assumption being used. Okay, let's then make the model slightly less general. Let's consider linear Gaussian state space models, where basically both those nonlinear mappings, like both the dynamics and the observations are just linear mappings, basically just matrices in this case, and Q and R are, are Gaussian. Then this system has a very nice closed form solution. Solution in terms of that, uh, given, you, given some observations why, you can actually uh, solve the following two marginal posteriors of, of X. The first one is called the filtering solution. And it's given by something called the Kalman filter, which is just the, the closed form solution for this type of equations uh, that has been given uh, this particular name. So basically the Kalman filter gives you the marginals for xk given observations up to time point k. And that is exactly Gaussian which is actually quite beautiful. Um, something called a smoothing solution, then again, means that it's the, the uh, marginal posteriors of XK given all the data points up to some distant time point uh, T, capital T in this case. And it's also Gaussian. And the Kalman filter can give you these, these posteriors in linear time complexity and linear memory complexity, which is very nice. Of course, then, um, many systems are not linear. Um, so then in that case, one simplification is to still consider the state, uh, like posterior, marginal posterior to be Gaussian. And that is often the case in nonlinear filter methods, which can also be very efficient and are of course like approximative, but gives you this approximately Gaussian posteriors then that you can deal with. Um, often this is done in practice with like linearization or in matching moments. As an example of this, I have, I have this, uh, this sense of fusion example, where we consider um, like basically the actuometer gyroscope sensor streams from a smartphone, which uh, affect the dynamics, that's sort of the prior of, of the system. And the observations here are camera frames, which are uh, not as fast sampled as, as the, the other sensors, but then are the device observations. And this is very much an online learning problem because the, uh, of course, if we want to track here, the, the position and orientation of the smartphone, that needs to be tracked online, but also we need to learn some sensor noises and biases in order for the system to actually give up something sensible. So this is like a real time uh, motion tracking thing. So first, 
here you see what actually is happening. Let's not make it too easy for the, for the uh, methods. And then you see what the, the phone sees. These are basically the observations why. And this, of course, like slowed down. And that's quite a lot of motion blur and uh, not very simple. And then uh, with nonlinear column filtering, basically, we can solve the like, real time inference problem, which gave, gave us the, the part of the mobile phone then in the air. Of course, Sometimes making the assumption that the hidden state X would be Gaussian is too restrictive. In that case, we need to resort to sampling, basically uh, sequential Monte Carlo, which is also known as particle filtering. The good thing is that in that case, we can deal with multimodality, severe nonlinearities, peculiar noises, and so on. But then again, all the usual Monte Carlo related problems also apply. As an example of this, I have a similar uh, motion tracking example with a smartphone. But now I try to use the compass sensor in the smartphone, that is the magnetometer, and match the observations of the magnetometer to a pre existing magnetic field anomaly map. Basically, a map of small changes in the earth magnetic field inside the building. Basically, due to metal in the structures of the building and so on. And single observations are by no means very informative in this case. But then, when I walk along, like around the building long enough, sort of the, the anomaly track that I observe becomes unique. Let's see how that works. So, basically, first, there's like multiple modes. Everything sort of the magnetic field track that I have observed fits many places. But then when I have acquired a long enough path, then it fits uniquely only uh, in the right place. OK, uh, the first part is ending. And uh, I gave you a quick introduction uh, into uh, like discrete time things, and we are continuing into continuous time models next. That is basically I'm introducing you uh, some stochastic differential equations which model like dynamics in a stochastic way. Uh, I'm also providing you with some uh, pointers to relevant uh, books in this case that give you like a more proper overview of, about these things. So the first two is about more like classical uh, control theory and signal processing things. Uh, the uh, third one is about uh, discrete time, basically filtering and smoothing things. And the last one is uh, giving like a nice overview about uh, particle filtering uh, in practice. Thank you. Hello. I hope you could hear me now. <clears throat> so uh, that was the first part. And this part is now live. So uh, I'm here for, for answering your questions, if you have any. Uh, and we have about 15 minutes for, for discussion and uh, questions. And I guess the, the way this, this works the best is that you, you raise your hand if you have questions. And then uh, I'll try to uh, notice that and then uh, um, pick, pick you, and then you should be able to unmute yourself for for uh, uh, asking questions, or then uh, feel free to uh, use the the chat box, the chat window uh, here in Zoom for for asking things, or then you can uh, use the the Rocket Chat chat service uh, for also asking asking things. So um, while you think of possible questions. Uh, that was the first first part of four parts in the tutorial. Um, uh, I called it warm up, but uh, it was maybe more introducing some like uh, like the overall uh, topic, and uh, then like uh, some something about like discrete time time things. 
that are then also used later on in, in the tutorial, mostly in part three. Maybe. So Mark uh, Dysonroth is asking in the in the, uh, the rock chat about uh, uh, complexity. So uh, I guess uh, if Mark is here, we can also ask that live. But um, uh, the question is basically um, that I mentioned like linear, uh, uh, linear time complexity for the Kalman filter. Um, and it's, it's indeed, it's like the complexity is uh, like linear regards to, to the number of time points, like temporal observations, uh, and also uh, linear in the, the, the amount of, of memory you need for, for each point. So basically you have a fixed cost per, per point. But then what is not linear is then if your state dimension grows. So basically the, the dimensionality of your, your axes, if they grow, uh, then you're typically cubic in in the in the uh, state dimensionality, which can then of course become costly if you have like a if you if you want to store a lot of information uh, that you want to squeeze in into the states. So I guess uh, I guess uh, the question is is related to that. So uh, yeah, uh, good temporal scaling, not so great uh, scaling uh, with regards to to the size of the latent dimension. Um, there is a question here uh, now in the, the uh, Zoom chat. Um, ah, this, this is a kind of good, good one. So the question is how to choose spectral representation uh, versus state space representation for a given problem? Well, that that there is no one right answer to that. Uh, of course, like sometimes you might have, for example, like a sense of fusion task or some very clearly like purely temporal thing um, or with some like real time requirements, then like uh, sequential methods tend to be very good in, in practice. Uh, then again, uh, spectral things can have nice properties uh, uh, like um, various sort of uh, doing things in the Fourier domain or then uh, using like basis function functions for approximating things uh, that can be like a handy thing. Uh, if, if you happens to have like certain like uh, specific type of a model that you're using, or uh, you have some like prior information about uh, what kind of sort of uh, basis uh, would span, span the problem well, uh, or, or then uh, it depends so much on the, on the application basically. So there's there's not one good good explanation uh, on one sort of textbook way of of, of picking what, what what to use. Uh, it's it's very application specific, I would say. Um, and, and if you're unhappy with with my answers, you you can ask more like uh, more detailed questions. Um, um, then there's a question about what is the my uh, opinion on the biggest challenges uh, from moving from uh, the mindset of classical treatment of signal processing to using ML for it. Well, uh, someone once said not very long long ago that uh, people in ML think that everyone uh, everything has been invented in the, in the last ten years, uh, and I think this. Like for young researchers, like we, we tend to to think of what's what's happening now and and the papers that we have been reading in the last years and so on, but the fact is that uh, a lot of great great science has been done uh, done in the past, and uh, some of that has also been forgotten. So I think sometimes uh, I tend to see people are reinventing things that are actually very well uh, dealt with and known 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 about uh, in like in the past. So there's like, especially in signal processing, there's so much great research done in like late 40s, early 50s, and then 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, early 2000s, and, and even, even today. So like there's uh, like a long continuum of things. And in ML, uh, we, we don't always sort of tend to find those things because like the terminology and notation is so different. So I think maybe that is the greatest challenge. So how to how to be be able to find find that great work from the past? I think that's that's that might be the greatest challenge. 
Um, yeah, there is there is a question that please also mention convolution uh, as a central part of signal processing. Indeed, indeed, uh, convolution is a very central part. And uh, I actually originally thought of including a bullet point about that on the same slide with the Fourier transforms and Laplace transforms and so on. But somehow I, I probably forgot I, in, in the haste. So uh, that's a very good point. So convolutions, of course, link very much to, to the other things. So basically also like analyzing things uh, like convolutions have like these nice properties uh, when you take the like Fourier transforms or Laplace transforms. So then you, you recover convolutions in a different form. Uh, but overall convolutions, of course, like both in temporal, temporal convolutions and, and spatial convolutions are central to both signal processing and machine learning. Yeah, indeed, good point. I'll check the other chat. Um, uh, there's a question. Uh, if there's a more exact schedule for uh, what I'm going to present, uh, indeed, the next part, the next 30 minutes is about uh, SDEs. After that, uh, the, the uh, 30 minutes after that is uh, about Gaussian processes, like how to integrate Gaussian processes uh, both in signal processing and in ML, and what the links are between those. And the last 30 minutes is uh, very much about applications, about the things that uh, have been presented in the earlier parts. Um, yeah, that's that's maybe the, the uh, overview of, of the remaining parts. Um, Please, could you give a short overview about sequential Monte Carlo? Uh, indeed, uh, sequential Monte Carlo uh, with particle filtering. So uh, I tend to look at sequential Monte Carlo as the ultimate hammer, or like the tool that you use when when uh, your problem is of is a certain kind, or uh, you don't want to to make any approximations, and if you have like suitably low dimensional states. Uh, of course, that can be circumvented in some some cases. Uh, but sequential Monte Carlo is is basically like Monte Carlo for for um, for the sequential methods. And often in in uh, like the filtering literature, it's called like a particle filtering, which kind of makes sense because you kind of have a bunch of particles that you spread out, and then those evolve and you you weight them and reweight them and so on, and that sort of represents your your like distribution for, for, the, for the states. Um, I think what the basic concepts of, of sequential Monte Carlo are very, very simple. Uh, what then becomes very complicated then again is, is doing efficient inf inference uh, using sequential Monte Carlo, um, using uh, all kinds of tricks to, uh, to deal with if you have like uh, partly linear states and partly nonlinear states, you can do like, oh, it's called raw blackization. Um, that leads to very neat, uh, neat uh, things. Uh, and what then becomes sort of very complicated, at least uh, I think it's complicated, um, is then how to do like, like not only filtering, but also smoothing, like conditioning on all data. So basically, it's easy to go forward with uh, particle filtering or sequential to Carlo. Uh, complicated to go backwards, sort of condition the states on kind of future data. Uh, there are great methods for that, uh, kind of theoretical, but also uh, working well in practice. Uh, I tend to look at Thomas Schoen's papers when I, I want to uh, learn about these things, and uh, that's what I might recommend. These are also covered in many books, uh, so uh, yeah. Yeah, that's maybe what I have to say about that. Um, there is a question. Uh, 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 am I also going to discuss neuro ODs and SDs? Indeed, I am in the last part. Um, so basically, uh, in the applications part, uh, I have some examples of that. Uh, I well. I try to cover so much, maybe too much. So uh, I basically have two, three slides on that only. 
Um, there is a question uh, whether state space methods are suitable for applications where the observations are uh, irregular in time. So like your observations are not equidistant. Indeed, this is actually some like a common confusion. But yeah, there is no such requirement that the observations should be equidistant. Uh, they can be observed irregularly. That's that's totally fine. Yeah. You just need to account for that in the dynamics. Um, um, more questions? Um, um, if it comes to, uh, sorry, uh, let's take this first. Um, could one replicate what CNN does with wavelet transform combined with other stuff from signal processing or math? For instance, uh, dictionary learning. That's that's a broad question. Uh, I guess for yeah, uh, complicated question, uh, very short answer. Uh, I guess in some cases, there are like direct links that you can sort of uh, recover the same solutions. For example, if you think of uh, like basic feed forward neural networks uh, combined with certain transforms and uh, certain bases, uh, you can in some cases at least recover the exactly same thing that you're doing with the neural network. Um, then with uh, like uh, CNNs, available transforms and uh, stacking all sort of uh, tools together, uh, it might be too general of a question, but uh, in certain special cases, I guess you can recover the same things. And of course, like what is the benefit of combining, uh, stacking things and combining them uh, like, uh, if, if on the other hand, you could just have a more flexible and more uh, complicated neural network that you try to try to train. Um, so then of course, uh, uh, there are the classical things that uh, of course, if you have just, just a small data set in small data problems, you, you might like uh, end up overfitting and so on. So uh, you can think of all these, these things that you, you can then combine a sort of regularization methods or uh, or like simplifying things more like, uh, like squeezing things into like a lower number of parameters basically. Um, when we do particle filtering inference, do we are required to specify any transition functions or sequential data in order to train state-based model? Uh, often in signal processing, the transition functions are given while in machine learning, we want to learn them. This is maybe uh, maybe a, a clear difference. Uh, of course, like in signal processing, then the like transition functions might have some free parameters, and then those are optimized, which is kind of kind of the same thing as training parameters in machine learning. So there is a strong overlap between these two. Yeah. Uh, am I out of time? I guess so. Um, so I guess the next part should be starting uh, quite soon. And uh, I don't know how that will happen. So I might just sort of be cut off at some point. Um, there is a question here. Uh, how is the model affected when there are random delays in the observations? Uh, mm, so basically, the, if the uh, transition model in discrete time uh, can account for like the, like the delta t between points, uh, then that can be accounted for directly. But this is basically why we, we, or at least I often like to think of things in, in terms of continuous time models and then solve those for discrete time steps because that sort of takes care of the, the uh, irregular timings and sort of random observation times. Um, okay, now I have, have a private message from, from, uh, from the stre streamer. So basically, uh, I guess it's uh, in the 15 minutes for this, this part is up and you can continue to ask questions in the, in the rocket chat. I'll answer them, them there. 
But let's move to the second part, which is indeed about uh, continuous time models. Hello there. Um, that was the first part of the tutorial now. So basically now in between the parts, there is an opportunity for you to ask questions here over Zoom. Uh, you can use the questions and answers uh, feature for asking questions or then the, the chat window window as well. Uh, and also uh, during the, the, uh, the videos playing, uh, I'm available uh, in the rocket chat and uh, there's questions there as well. So you can, you have many ways of asking questions in other words. Um, so while you think of possible questions, uh, um, I can check the chat window. So basically uh, in this first part, uh, it's kind of, kind of warm up. Um, but also then uh, a bit about some like tools, some like uh, commonly known things, things to, to signal processing, uh, basically mathematical tools that uh, often pop up in, in machine learning that I went through. Uh, and then the, the rest of the, the, uh, the first part was, was concerned with uh, state space modeling, uh, basically discrete time models. Um, there is there's a question here uh, in the rocket chat, um, what does the transfer function with the ratio of Laplace transform signify? What does it mean for the ratio of output and input to be large? Intuitively, uh, it is fair to assume that rated uh, IO would give large ratio. Um, so basically, if you think of, of uh, how I represented it on, on the slide, sort of halfway through, through the first part, so basically, um, if you have an input uh, signal, a like continuous time uh, input signal uh, X, X uh, depends on T, and an output signal Y, T, and if you take the Laplace transforms of that, that so uh, like commonly known, like old school uh, signal processing in, is analyzing sort of the, the transfer functions, basically what, what happens to, to the signal when it uh, comes in as an input and then uh, flows out as an output. So what, what happens in between? And one way of, of analyzing that is, is in terms of transfer functions. So basically uh, you, you can take the, the Laplace transform of, of basically all the, the components that uh, are involved. And basically what you then end up uh, analyzing is, is the, the transfer function, which is basically the ratio between, between the Laplace transforms of the inputs and outputs. And there are a lot of like uh, theory related to this, um, but maybe uh, something that I don't really cover here in the tutorial, but is actually quite interesting is that in the later parts where we look at, at GPU models. So there, if you study the, the transfer functions, they actually have a polynomial and rational, like you have like, like a polynomial upstairs and a polynomial downstairs. And uh, those like uh, polynomial coefficients actually tell a lot about the the DSD model that, that you, you end up with. So it's, it's basically an alternative tool of, of looking in, uh, into these sort of temporal systems. And there's, there's a lot of like old school theory, uh, like on, on observability and controllability that are sort of related to, to, uh, to these, these concepts and as well, as well as state space models. But it's, it's sort of a part of the, the wider signal processing tooling. I, I hope that that helped a bit. Mm, then there's a question in the rocket chat. How can I access uh, to your slides? Uh, basically, this was a recurring question during the morning run as well, or like my morning, uh, probably your night or something like that. Um, so uh, I have the handout versions of the slides now on my web page, and my web page can be found at at arno.salin.fi. And then if you scroll down a bit, you should find find the the, the slides. I hope that helps. I can answer answer that later on. Then there's a question that I mentioned old school methods. Yeah, I, I should maybe be more careful here. Um, so the, the question is, you mentioned old school methods. How is the field changing with the introduction of machine learning? So basically, uh, maybe what I, I call old school methods uh, is, is, uh, is maybe more of the kind of uh, mathematical foundations that were, were very much developed in, in the late 1940s, uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, 
uh, um, and maybe a bit later as well, uh, like really good research uh, that is perhaps even a bit forgotten at the moment, at least in, in, in like the machine learning circles, uh, which is kind of sad, I think. Um, but there's a lot of like very good theory, uh, less applications, like not many implementations at that time. It's more like, like uh, theoretical foundations on how, how to deal with these things which actually are very, very well thought of and have a lot of respects for, for, for the people and the researchers from that time. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of the, the old school. And the, the, the methods are not old in a way that they would be outdated or, 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 or anything like that. They are just already sort of, uh, well, time has passed since, since they were developed. Um, but then like uh, the second part of the question was that how, how ha have the things changed uh now with, with machine learning uh well the, like i think singular processing is still going strong in itself but of course like much of the audio modeling and things uh have been uh, like a lot of, like influenced by by sort of uh inventions in in, in machine learning in later years um but there's a lot of overlap and there's a lot of researchers who, who like uh are active sort of in both both fields um but maybe maybe the mindset is slightly different in in like signal processing. Often the applications that are, are of interest are for like tracking or or uh, or like more traditional control or so on. So and they, they, like in signal processing, there are very sort of established uh, journals and uh, and publication forums that are kind of orthogonal to to these like machine learning conferences and, and journals that that maybe the audience here tends to publish in or aims to publish in. Um, let's see, there are more questions. There are several questions here. Um, um, the question is uh, about the noises uh, in, in the system dynamics. Uh, what sort of particular structure is considered for the noise? Uh, this depends a lot. So uh, in the examples and sort of the models that I showed now in the first part, uh, the noises were typically assumed Gaussian. That is actually not very restrictive. If you have a nonlinear you know, system, you can pass that Gaussian thing, the Gaussian noise through some nonlinear transformation. And that then of course becomes very non-Gaussian. Non or then uh, if you do particle filtering, you're not restricted to, to Gaussian noise in, in any way. So, it can basically be anything. Then it just sort of puts restrictions on what sort of inference you can do. Um, then there's a question. Uh, would you say that someone has to go through knowing Fourier Laplace transformation before applying machine learning? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't say that. I, I think most people who do machine learning nowadays uh, don't know what a Fourier transform is. That's my sort of general feeling when uh, when discussing with students. Uh, but of course, like uh, many 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 people have a good mathematical foundation. But but then uh, uh, you can do machine learning without knowing knowing what those things are. And of course, like if you you then want to uh, want to build new things and uh, understand things more deeply, uh, knowing sort of foundational like basic basic tools and things. Is, is never a bad idea. I, I hope that, that answered the question. Um, um, then there's a question, what is an intuitive way to understand the use of smoothing? Uh, basically, the I think, at least for me, the most intuitive way of, of thinking is that uh, filtering uses all the data up till that time when you have the filtering quantity estimated. While smoothing uses also the future data from some distant uh, future time index. So in, in if you think of like batch problem solving, uh, they usually consider all the data at once. So then they basically do, do, do smoothing. But then if you try to do online things, then you of course only have access to the data you have seen this far. So that's basically filtering. I hope that, that helped. Um, Then there's a question, do you have any reference papers about estimating the smartphone position for acceleration plus gyroscope plus video? 
is it done with a linear model or nonlinear one? Uh, this, this, that example is actually based on, on a, a previous paper uh, by me and some of my students. Um, it's basically like a probabilistic approach for visual inertial odometry. Um, and I, I have a lot of more examples on my web page on that. Uh, I sure might not be a link there. Uh, I should add that. Um, but yeah, there's a paper. It's called PIVO, the method. Um, and the method uh, there is basically based on a, a nonlinear uh, state space model. Um, yeah, the details are, are in the paper. Yeah, you can find that on my web page. Um, still have a couple of minutes left. Um, there's a question. You gave a very interesting example of comparing the Kalman filter dynamics with the scene of flipping a phone viewed by an external camera. Uh, it was not external, it's actually like the camera in the phone. Uh, can you please explain it again? I think it did, I didn't understand it good enough. Uh, so indeed, uh, consider a smartphone. It's actually this phone here. Uh, it's basically just a basic iPhone. It has a camera and then some uh, motion sensor, basically an accelerometer, a gyroscope. Those are quite low quality. Sorry, Apple, uh, you could do better, I guess. Um, so then if you just try to estimate motion based on, on the inertial sensors, uh, you're not doing a very good job. So then uh, in that example, uh, I use those sensors for the dynamics that kind of gives the prior for what the motion is like. But then uh, I used the, the uh, camera frames from the phone when the phone was moving because not all the frames were that bad. Some were good, some were bad. Um, and those frames basically were used in tracking some feature points uh, as we are in the view. And then everything was put in, in sort of um, uh, a, a nonlinear Kalman filtering framework. And then uh, all the biases for the sensors and everything were learned online. Um, and that then sort of gave the, gave the, the tracking uh, like result. So basically the filtering result that you were looking at. Uh, that was still quite short. Uh, maybe the paper helps. That's in the, in the PIVO paper. Uh, we still have a bit of time. Um, there's a question, why is it called filtering? And what is the intuition of particle filtering? I have no idea. I think filtering and smoothing are really bad names for what is actually happening. Um, so uh, like, uh, I think people usually uh, like link filtering and smoothing to something, something uh, quite different, but that's how it is. Um, um, yeah, what is the intuition uh, behind particle filtering? The intuition is basically that the, the, the current state or your current estimate of, of the, the, the filtering distribution is characterized by samples, sample points. Those are particles, small like dots in your high dimensional, low dimensional space. Uh, and then you just sort of, uh, yeah, you you think of your your uh, your probability mass in terms of those particles, how they are distributed. That's the the idea behind particle filtering. Um, there's many questions still. I'll answer uh, one more um, and then the rest I will answer by typing. Um, how do people usually do parameter estimation in state space models? Uh, say it's non uh, linear and non Gaussian. Um, that is a good question. Uh, there are many ways of doing uh, parameter estimation in, in uh, state space models. Uh, you can do, do like, uh, like uh, basically. Uh, try to uh, approximate the marginal likelihood uh, and, and use that. Or then uh, you can use like EM. Uh, there are methods for that, or there are a lot of methods for, for doing, doing parameter estimation. Uh, uh, like uh, that's a whole of its own field uh, in, in signal processing. But I would, I would probably use like try to approximate the marginal likelihood and, and then uh, use that. That would probably be my my uh, method of choice, choice here. 